Today I have an interview, and this is the video version of the P2 Sports Care podcast. It's going to be with Jay Z or Jen Zerling, who is going to talk to us about how to jumpstart your metabolism through high intensity training, which is HITS training to be short. Jennifer Zerling is someone you can definitely contact and get a hold of. She does do online programming, and I think when you listen to this podcast, you won't be disappointed. This might just change your life. Share with a friend, subscribe, stay tuned. Hi everyone, here is Jay-Z, and uh, you'll remember her from one of the other podcasts, because I think it's number 32 or something like that, but Jay-Z, say hey. Hey, what's up? What's up? <laughs> long time, huh? Yeah, long time no here. Yeah. Do you, do you hear that in the background, by the way, my emails? It, no, is it pinging? <laughs> okay, good. As long as you don't hear that, we're good to go. <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought it was my squeaky chair or something you were saying, and this is a pretty comfortable chair. I didn't want to get out of it, really. Well, I would expect a chiropractor to sit in only comfortable chairs. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is the first podcast that I've done where I went from a... I have this little dental stool that my dad gave me because he's a dentist. And this it's a spirally, spinny one that you can spin around in, and it's not very comfortable. But it's it's the perfect size, so I just switched. Oh, very nice. It's nice to know that you're being active, being that you're talking to a fitness expert. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'm not doing squats while we're talking, so... <laughs> Um, so if uh, so, we're going to talk about today high intensity training and short or short workouts and how they can jumpstart your metabolism. And I thought you'd be a badass person to talk to you about that. Can you actually give us a little bit about yourself first? Um, and then I know everyone's probably heard the other podcast, but if you haven't yet, listen to the other one too. I'll put a link in the podcast notes. Go ahead and tell us about yourself. You're awesome. Well, my name is Jay-Z. It's short for Jen Zerling, J-E-N-N, two N's. And I own the company Jay-Z Fitness. And I started that in about 2010. Um, I've been a fitness expert for now, gosh, going on 20 years soon, not to age myself, but I am also an age management expert. So that's kind of cool that I am getting older so that when people see me, they're like, oh, she obviously knows what she's doing because she looks... Uh, Younger than what she is, right? I, I, th I thought you just have to be Asian to be an age management spe age management specialist. You have to be what? Asian, because they always keep their age so well. If you always play the guessing game, like if you see an Asian person, <laughs> it looks like he's 20, but really he's 30. You always guess oh 10 gosh. years older. I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> oh, I, I got a lot of Asian friends. They all look they all look way younger than I do. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, whether you're from the Asian descent or African-American descent, I mean, I meet African-American people who are in their 50s, and I'm like, see, that's where I got shafted, because I'm white as can be, and it's like, if I smile too long, you'll see it all across my face, so. <laughs> why Why is that, by chance? Do you happen to know why certain, I mean, certain descents seem like they age better than others, or? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the uh, vitality and the anatomy of the skin cell matrix, I think, is you know, much thicker. The collagen is much different. The matrix itself is very different in these different populations. And, you know, if you look at like my family, we come from a Russian descent, which is very fair skinned. And that comes along with maybe, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know, less thick skin in the face areas, like all the areas that we don't want to age in your neck, you know, we've been cursed because we come from different parts of the world that, you know, the anatomy is just not as um, optimal, if you will. I'm trying to be nice about my own family <laughs> background. <laughs> yeah, you got screwed to be born into that family, huh? <laughs> I got screwed, exactly. You know, but that's why for me, it's, you know, it, it's really nice because this whole career started out as being a trainer. And then I evolved into um, an expert going back for my master's degree in kinesiology, which lent itself into me doing a master's program. Um, my thesis was about childhood obesity, which put me into the spotlight of wanting to break the chains of obesity, which is the name of my book. Um, so I ended up doing my study on 200 students in an elementary school, proving that we could actually decrease body composition in people who exercise correctly. And the study was essentially that, which is what we're talking about today high intensity interval training. I did that with the fourth and fifth grade kids who are prepubescent. And, you know, obviously their hormones are not part of the picture, but 
it was kind of cool that after six weeks I was able to decrease body fat in all the students that did my program. Mm -hmm. And that got me interested in wanting to do something bigger with the obese population. So right after my master's program, I ended up going into medical weight loss and I worked with um, morbidly obese people for approximately four and a half, five years, um, thousands and thousands of patients who really wanted to lose weight, but you know, needed medical intervention. So I got to manage doctors and nurses. It was a really great opportunity for me. I also got to learn a lot about the psychology behind weight loss and why people struggle with weight, but also the medical aspect, working with these medical personnel who were really good at what they did. So there was that. And then I ended up evolving into um, age management medicine, where I left medical weight loss and I worked with doctors who prescribed their patients with hormone replacement therapy. So all along that path, you know, compound that with managerial experience in very huge health clubs, you know, down the street from you was the sports club LA. I was the manager there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I look back and it's like, wow, it's almost 20 years total that I've been an expert as a, you know, as a fitness trainer, but I only kind of fell into the nutritional aspect over the last 10 years of that 20 year span. And that was with direct intervention and working with these doctors. Um, even to this day, I work for a company called Optimal Medical Group and we, you know, work, I work with their fitness and nutrition. So it's just all really good stuff. So long story short, I'm Jay-Z from Jay-Z Fitness and I'm an independent contractor for multiple companies, but it all stems from, you know, this whole wave of a journey that has been created in time and just, you know, my interest is growing and growing. Like I love epigenetics. I'm like, wow, maybe one day I'll go back for a PhD just in epigenetics on how we could turn on and off the switches of our you know, genetic blessings or our genetic curses. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just, just, just back to you. You're probably thinking about that smile thing again, aren't you? The genetic blessings and curses. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'm like, <laughs> don't make me laugh too much, man, because you know, I don't want to smile too much on this podcast. I'm going to get wrinkled up. So yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so I'm guessing you said, you said that with the kids, then you were, you were doing, uh, this type of training that we're going to, so high intensity or H I I T. Um, hits training, and uh, I'm guessing because kids usually don't want to do, like if you had them run 10 miles, they would probably want to kill you, right? I mean, was it more interesting to them at least too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I run an after-school program right now for Matthew McConaughey, and I can't even get these kids to run one mile, let alone 10, and these are high schoolers. So high-intensity interval training for kids and even for high school students, you can't make it boring like you said it's got to be something fun so i'll give you an example you know for the program i did on monday i go every monday to the high school i did like a family feud um, where two teams they're standing face to face on a basketball court they have two bean bags and whoever drops the bean bag first gets to answer the question and it was all questions that were based on fitness and nutrition so that i'm teaching these students while they're doing physical activity so let's just say for example i said okay name one lean protein and then you know the person drops the bean bag and they're like um nuts <laughs> and, and, and and you know if i feel like being obnoxious i'm like hey nuts are healthy fat so <laughs> i say the penalty is your team gets to do 10 push-ups and they're like oh man so you know it, it's and i i make it very clear to the students i don't mean to punish you with exercise but they have so much fun learning about you know facts about nutrition and fitness but then they're also forced to be working as a team together and the support that they give each other and you know when they get angry at each other it's kind of fun and all good times you know but with the elementary school kids I ended up doing a circuit of exercises that were the same for six weeks and the reason why you got to do it that way is because when you study something you can't it's got to be consistent, okay? Research has to be very, very simple. Otherwise, there's too many variables and then you can't prove anything. Mm -hmm. So I had them elevate their heart rate for 10 different stations. There was one station of those 10 stations and they would do it for 30 seconds to a minute, which is a long time for kids. And we would elevate their heart rate and I'd have on the fifth station, they would test to see that their heart rate was elevated. We used pulse readers, mm -hmm. okay, where they put their little uh, finger on the pulse to see that their heart rate was within the range of high intensity intervals. Okay, and if the answer was yes, then we wanted to see if there was a direct correlation between 
um, doing a high intensity program and decreasing body fat. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we learned that with these fourth and fifth graders, the ones who are in the experimental group lost body fat. But here's the caveat. We followed up with an interview, like a questionnaire, asking these students, did you increase your physical activity in the last six weeks? Did you change your nutrition? Are you more inspired to be healthy and fit? So all these students who were involved in the program answered, yes, life changed for me. I'm more active at home. I'm eating better. I'm eating less chips. And I didn't talk about nutrition. All I did was tell them to, to go through HIT, high intensity interval training. And we saw a tremendous decrease in body composition. So I can't say that my study is the reason why they lost fat. Yeah. It could be that my study was the catalyst to losing fat and they ultimately lost fat because they changed their lifestyle, right? Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure you got to have both. Like I know that you said you spent the first 10 years uh, from the ages of 10 to 20 doing fitness and then you went from 20 to 30, which you are now, doing fitness and nutrition. So in the beginning when you're, that was a joke about age. Um, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in the first 10 years or so, were you thinking like, like, or actually the last 10 years, did you think, I can't believe I didn't do this nutritional part because these kids seem to do it on their own because that was one of the things, right? I mean, so it has to be part of it, right? It has to be part of it. Nutrition is everything. And honestly, I never went back to school to get my didactics uh, credential because, you know, I, I had to really look into myself and say, at the end of the day, I'm not telling sick patients to go on a specific diet. What I'm doing is I'm getting people to eat more plants, get their lean proteins and eat their healthy fats. And you know, your 94 year old grandmother could tell people to get more vegetables in their diet. It's not rocket science, you know, but what sets me apart from other trainers in my industry is that I have that clinical background where I actually got to work with and still work with patients who are underneath a doctor's care. Yeah. So, you know, that that's really a lucky situation where, you know, I fell into that, but you know, I have many, many certifications in nutrition and, you know, the years of experience of working with so many individuals has definitely positioned me to um, be able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So on the topic of high intensity training then, and uh, let's go over some examples of what it is, what it's not, um, where you can find something like that. Can you do, can you create a program with something like that? Um, I want to make sure that everyone's not misled about thinking what it is. I'm so glad you bring that up because I do want to touch upon upon a very important point. Instagram and all of these other social media platforms gives people the permission slip to show what they perceive is the right thing to do. Okay, so with that said, and you're a doctor, so you would appreciate this, high intensity interval training is raising your heart rate up to at least 65% of your max heart rate. And usually that's where exercise begins. So when you look at the higher interval, it's got to be more towards the 90% range. You have trainers who are basically telling their clients, I want you to jump onto that you know, box and jump down and jump up and jump down. Well, yeah, that's going to raise someone's heart rate and it's going to raise it to the point that we're talking about today, but it's also putting that client at risk for hurting themselves orthopedically. Okay, so I like controlled situations. I'll give you a great example is Tabata method. Um, that's kind of where... You know, he's basically the pioneer of high intensity interval training. I'm sure there's maybe even people before him, but the whole idea of high intensity interval training is elevating your heart rate up in a very short period of time, keeping the workouts very short, like no more than 30 minutes at a time. And if someone doesn't have 30 minutes, Tabata is only four minutes. And his studies have actually shown a tremendous improvement in blood pressure, uh, decreased inches on the waist, you know, and hips. So, and all Tabata is in that four minute period is eight intervals, eight intervals of work. Think of taking your heart rate up to 90% of your maximum heart rate minimum for 20 seconds. So if you grab a jump rope and jump at a very high intense rate for 20 seconds, maybe the first interval you're fine, but I'm only giving you a 10 second recovery, which is nothing. So by the third interval, you're like, oh my Lord, I got to you know, how many more intervals, Jay-Z, you know, yeah, and you're like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, 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 it creeps up on you really quickly. Uh, Crystal had us do, we, we had one patient do a Tabato kettlebell swings here and she's like, you want to do with this? I'm like, Sh sure. And halfway through, I'm like, nope, I don't want to do the next one. Cause we did a couple with, with her that day. Um, right. 
so uh, how come everyone thinks, and I, I know we're going to go into the, the reason for adding high intensity. How come everyone, when they want to lose weight, all of a sudden they put on some jogging shoes and start running for like three hours? Well, I'm not going to go against that. I mean, jogging and running is the best cardiovascular that you could possibly do. You know, it's total body propulsion. You have a huge metabolic demand on your cardiovascular systems because you have every single muscle engaged when you run. And obviously, less muscle recruitment is better for runners because you don't want to waste any energy. But for a novice runner, they're elevating the shoulders, they're huffing and puffing. There's just a very strong demand for running. So Mm -hmm. when people say, I want to lose weight, I mean, technically, they should drop weight before they run a bunch of miles at a time because it's just too much on the joints in the long run. But even if they run for a mile and they're way overweight, guess what the brain is telling the body? Dude, I'm not going to carry you for a full mile three days a week. You got to drop this. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole physiological response to that, which helps people drop weight quickly. But people have to be careful that they don't hurt their joints you know, with what they're dealing with. Yeah, I agree with that. And you, you said earlier with the high intensity stuff, one of my, that was going to be one of my questions was, uh, how safe is high intensity? And, um, I, I know for a while, like there were, you know, there's a lot of people doing box jumps, jump up, jump down, jump up and down. And all of a sudden they, they started taking away the jump down part and they do a step down. And like, I feel like there's a lot of people that aren't really conditioned well to do that especially if they're trying to lose weight. I mean, they've probably been deconditioned for a little while, you know, and not to say you can't ever do it, but it's like I could think of a thousand of, I mean, not a thousand, maybe a hundred different things you could do to get your heart rate up without having that jump down portion, you know, and same thing with running too. It's just sometimes it's a little bit negligent in the beginning, I think. Right. Well, there's also closed chain high intensity interval training. So closed chain when your foot is connected to a surface and you ultimately don't have to pound the joints. Take the elliptical, for example. I do that with my clients all the time. You know, I'm not a big fan of equipment. I think our body is built to move in all planes of motion and we got to treat the body the way it's built. So, but because it's such a controlled environment and as a trainer, if my number one goal is to elevate the heart rate, to really get that hormonal response that comes along with elevating the heart rate to that high range, then I'm going to take that overweight client onto something that's more controlled, like an elliptical, so that we could achieve that, but also not hurt them. Mm -hmm. So I know the reason I brought up that running uh, comment was originally because I know a lot of people think they get that 500 calories a day, you get a deficit, you do it for a a week and that's a pound, right? A pound off. So they, they want the calorie deficit and they know how many calories it takes to run per an hour and so on. High intensity, I mean, you're only doing it for what? You said 30 minutes. Like how does this equate? It, you know, like how can people think of this as, as being a weight loss mechanism? Okay, which is a great question. So a lot of people don't have time to exercise for longer than a certain period of time. The good news is with high intensity interval training, it creates an epoch response and that's post exercise oxygen consumption. So if you think about the more money you spend on a credit card, the harder you have to work to repay back that credit card. You might have to get a second job. You might have to, you know, cut back corners and mentally work harder to pay down that debt. And the body works the same way. So when you actually put your heart rate in those tremendous ranges, you know, take somebody like me whose resting heart rate is in the 60 range, you know, even high 50s, uh, depending on what day you talk to me. You know, if I if I <laughs> if I bring my heart rate up to 190, that huge variability from 57 beats per minute to 190 beats per minute is such a tremendous range of motion that it's putting a ton of demands on my body. And if I only do that for five intervals, I still can have tremendous benefits from doing that. Okay, and I think that people need to learn, especially deconditioned people. Maybe you start out small. Maybe you start out with five intervals, which last 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Maybe you start with Tabata. Is it going to be easy? Is it going to be comfy? No, it's not. But we're just talking about time constraints. Now, let's take someone with asthma who has no time. 
maybe that person just by showing up to a workout and they may not get to 90% of their max, but by them getting to even 70% of their max, that's still going to bring tremendous benefits to that individual for the first month until they build up that cardiovascular base um, versus if they didn't do anything. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So each person brings a unique level of fitness initially. And I don't think my industry does a service for people by saying you have to do X amount of time in order to lose X amount of pounds because some people don't even want to get started when they hear that overwhelming number. Yeah, I agree. I, f I feel like half the time, it isn't the thing like they say, going to the gym, the hardest part is going to the gym. It's not really when you're there. So I, I always thought that like with just creating the effort, like showing that there's some type of motivation to improve whatever their goal is, is, is the first step. So I don't know. I personally wouldn't even care if they showed up and did 10 minutes of an hour session. At least they showed up. You know, that's the hardest thing for them, I think. That's right. And you know what? It might even be that they just walk for the first couple of weeks and we're not even doing high intensity interval training the first couple of weeks. If someone's listening to this podcast and they're like, I don't even want my heart rate to beat that fast, then start by building up your cardio respiratory uh, base rate, you know, your aerobic fitness level, that's going to be 65%, which is still uncomfortable for someone who has not ever trained before. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I work with a lot of overweight clients and for them to drive their heart rate up to 90% in the first couple of months is, you know, not reasonable for some of these people. Okay, but if I take them for a very brisk walk in the park and their heart is beating and they're like, Jay-Z, am I having a heart attack? No, you're not. <laughs> You'll you know? know when you're having a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you should never know. <laughs> well, on, on that note, because I know that you, so you've worked in, in medical clinics with people trying to lose weight. They do. Is there ever any concern with um, heart, like heart attacks or say people that have um, diabetes type two, like, are there a lot of barriers here where they're like, I don't know, like, I can't do that. I've been told not to. What's your experience on that? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Because in our clinic now, if the patient is over for males, like over 55 or so, and for females about that range as well, we ask that they get a stress test before we even do a VO2 max. Okay, so we use a VO2 max um, and thankfully, Dr. Chavez, who I work for, he actually has um, components, EKG components on his VO2 max. So if he sees any sort of irregularities in heart uh, beat or VO2 assessments, then he will have them follow up with a cardiac specialist before I come in writing them fitness prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, we, we dot our I's and cross our T's to ensure that our patients are in good hands and they're not jumping into a high intensity program without knowing whether or not their heart could handle it, especially if they have um, heart disease in their family history or any sort of heart condition, pulmonary condition, and or obesity as a comorbidity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we take a very thorough health history. If people have questions about if they're at risk for a heart attack by doing these types of programs, I think the very first step is to talk to their primary care doctor see if they can get a referral for um, a cardiac specialist, get a stress test. You know, if you're postmenopausal or postandropausal, which is the male version of menopause. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't wait to hear the symptoms of this. <laughs> oh, I, haven't heard the, I haven't heard the term yet. <laughs> so uh, that's like a whole, you'll have to have me back. Let's just talk about that in another <laughs> podcast, okay? <laughs> I thought it was going to be something like they started to read like the OC register and watch all the news channels. And that's what happens when I see people getting 55 plus <laughs> with guys well, anyways in my yeah. family. <laughs> well, because everybody wants to live on a life of fear, which I'm not a big advocate of. But, you know, for those diabetics, high intensity interval training completely promotes healthy blood sugar levels. OK, because you're actually forcing your body to utilize any excess sugar in the bloodstream as an energy fuel source where you're not just, you know, creating the stagnant um, blood sugar buildup and causing glycation and any other, you know, blood disorders that comes along with even pre-diabetics or people who are not even diagnosed as pre-diabetic and could have uh, blood sugar um, 
uh, irregulation. So I think that exercise is the number one medication that's being prescribed by doctors. The problem is most people don't do it because either A, they don't know where to start, or B, they're scared of getting hurt because, you know, their heart beats, they get a little sweaty and they're like, ooh, this is not comfortable, so this can't be good for me. <laughs> so, so how do we get through that? I know that um, I feel like most people know deep down inside, like, at least a couple healthy things they should be doing or a couple things they could do for exercise. I mean, walk, walk stairs. I mean, like, is what what gets people past that point and especially to the point where they can do or trust high intensity exercise i think people need to first come to terms with what their goals are okay because there's different types of situations with human behavior there's the people that are like tell me what i need to do and i'm going to do exactly what you tell me those are the people that do not mind being uncomfortable with high intensity intervals and you know even as an athlete myself i I never love high intensity interval training. It's not like one day you grow a love loving relationship. You know, I'd rather take Shavasana all day in a yoga class, you know, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, I think that's the first step for people who are not conditioned. I think that people need to either talk to a qualified professional, even if you hire a trainer for a few sessions, just to understand, you know, what, your heart rate should be in those different intervals. You know, you could actually, it's in my book, Breaking the Chains of Obesity. I, I give the entire formula for high intensity interval training. I have a whole tool on high intensity interval training. 107 um, tools, it looks like. Yeah, it's 107 <laughs> tools. And one tool <laughs> is dedicated to what we're talking about. So, <laughs> yeah. So, but, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, once you know your numbers, like that's step one, then step two is doing it where, you know, you actually feel what that feels like. And we're not saying it's got to be more than 20 seconds at a time, you know, and if you just do four minutes of high intensity interval training, that's considered excellent. Just take shorter recoveries in between, like the Tabata method is 10 seconds in between your 20 seconds of, you know, all out efforts and call it a day and then tomorrow maybe do it again and do it maybe only three times that week that's the first step is creating a goal and understanding why you're doing this to begin with okay the uh, let me re, uh, back up a little bit on that so if i heard you right if you do tabata th for these people what you just said three times a week is that only 12 minutes of actual exercise <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I hope everyone exactly. hears this. It sounds a lot better than running three hours to me. Anyways, <laughs> that sounds pretty damn easy, but I know it's not easy. <laughs> look, it's, look, nothing. everything is challenging but doable in life, okay? Mm -hmm. And as humans, we never, ever want to be uncomfortable. So the coolest thing is, at the end of the day, once you dive into a solid exercise program that gives you discomfort throughout the program – you come out as a much stronger human being at the end because anything in life that comes your way that's uncomfortable, you kind of relate it to what you physically and mentally go through when you're training, okay? And you're able to handle it because you have a mind of perseverance and mental strength. And really, we're on this planet for a purpose. And if you don't have a purpose, that's step one is to decide where you want to be in your life, you know, because being unhealthy is probably one of the worst things in the world is to not have any options because you're busy taking medications and visiting a doctor's office and putting your life in the hands of Western medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, if we are our own advocates and we notice that high intensity interval training, chiropractic treatments, optimal nutrition, getting your sleep and all this stuff can help preserve your youth and help you be strong until the day you die, then you're going to live a much more fruitful life and ultimately be happier and more fulfilled. Yeah, I agree. I think, I guess people got to find their own, they have to find their purpose, they find their goal. Um, I mean, how do they do it? I'm guessing in your book you have some, is there some type of worksheet to help them kind of get into that? Or how would you suggest people kind of start finding their purpose? That's a great question. I mean, you know, I just came out with a podcast called Fit Because, and it's it's exactly that, okay? We talk about different topics every single episode, and we just came out with it last month, so it's, it's pretty cool. We talk about stress management. We talk about having faith. We talk about goal setting, and, you know, that the podcast is really just to get people started. My book, Breaking the Chains of Obesity, is all about how I broke the chains of obesity from coming from a very overweight family background. You know, and as you know, epigenetics is the study of human genes and how we are the drivers of our own fate. 
And if we could turn off the switches associated with chronic illnesses, such as obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and so forth, then we really don't need to be victim to our genes. Yep. And my book gives you usable tools to eradicate the fears you might have, whether or not you're dealing with obesity right now, or whether or not you have a few pounds to lose and you're just scared that you're gonna be like your aunt or your mother or whoever it is who lost a limb or you know got every body part scoped out because their body was you know just not built to sustain good joint health you know you don't have to deal with that that's the good news you could change all of that and yeah my book your podcast can teach about you know all the physical aspects with all the you know medical professionals that you bring on i mean the information's out there it's just people have to want to access the information and then apply it to their own lives yeah i i totally agree and it, we were talking before the podcast started but we were trying to figure out how to get good information out there to people um and i still don't know the answer i'm sure it's all about marketing if you can sell a crappy product you can sell a good one or you can put out a good book or a bad book but it's all about the marketing aspect with it so I know there's good stuff out there. People just have to know where to look, you know? Right. You know, and it's, it's a matter of trusting individuals. I think that, you know, there's just a lot of marketing out there and people are like, well, what are they trying to sell me? You know, I, I, my mission, my purpose in life, uh, should I call you Dr. Gonzalez? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you be creative. You just call me whatever you want. <laughs> you call Dr. me Chuck. <laughs> I call you Seb. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to call you Zerlander earlier. <laughs> Are you going to call me Zerling? <laughs> Zer, Zer, no, Zerlander. Like Zoolander. Oh. <laughs> but Z Zerlander. <laughs> uh, are you calling me an Amazon woman? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Am Amazonian. Wait, you weren't that tall. You weren't that tall to be an Amazonian woman. Well, ironically, that's all relative, my friend, because to some men, I'm an Amazon woman because they're shorter than me. So. <laughs> Wait, how, tall are you? how tall are you again? You can't be. You're not over six foot. No, I'm five foot nine. Yeah, yeah, you're not an every Amazonian. Maybe you do your hair up sometime or something. You will, you will be. Oh, with the hairspray. <laughs> well, by the way, by the way, on your your book title, how you you I hear you're actually physically breaking a chain in half. Then possibly you're Amazonian. You, you should put something like relative next to you, like an elephant, and you're just towering over it or something. You know. That's a really good idea. Yeah, it's all about <laughs> being. <laughs> so. With high intensity, going back into that original study that you had, what were the 10 stations? Because I know probably everyone's thinking, wow, why don't I just take that one? Why don't I just do that study? Because it seemed to work for those kids. Okay, that's that's a great question. Let me try to remember this because it's from 2008. Okay. We had mountain climbers, jump roping, single leg hops. Uh, they had a bounce of basketball. And by the way, I incorporated skill sets associated with that age group. So that was another part of it. Um, which I thought was brilliant, but I'm not going to pat my own back on your <laughs> podcast, okay? <laughs> um, and then I had them do um, ladder Cur drills. Cursive you know, riding? What's that? Cursive riding? That's a skill drill. I'm just joking. <laughs> Go ahead, ladder drills. <laughs> um, yes, then I had them do bumping of a volleyball, so they had to run all over the place because they couldn't bump volleyballs on their forearms to save their life. Um, then they had to also do X jumps, so picture an X on the floor, they had to you know, start one way and then you know, hop onto the other part of the X back and forth for the full time of the interval. Uh, they had to do mountain climbers. Um, what else was there? Oh, and then they had to do um, abdominal work. I had them doing like crunches, which is more towards the end of the circuit. Uh -huh. So that probably elevated their heart rate just a smidgen. But you know, it's not like their heart rate was up the entire, entire time. It basically was up for majority of a 30 minute period. So if we brought their heart rate up for even like 10 minutes, okay, then that, that would have been your answer right there. If it was up the entire time, great. But that heart rate check wasn't done until station five. So four stations prior elevated their heart rate, two stations after elevated their heart rate. One station was like an interval of rest, you know, by bouncing a volleyball, for example, or bouncing a basketball, and then hop into another all out effort by jumping a rope, uh -huh. um, you know, or doing power jacks. Okay. So, you know, like jumping jacks was one of them as well. That elevates the heart rate and it's only 30 minutes total. So, if I'm able to say even five minutes or 10 minutes elevated these students' heart rates, at the end of the study, the ones who did the study lost body fat. How much okay. did they lose? I think I missed that part. 
or six weeks, right? Over six weeks. Yeah, it was a six week period. There was a significant loss. It wasn't the same across all the students, but statistically speaking, it was enough. Okay. Okay. Because we're always looking for statistical decreases. And was it like 1%? You know, it, it was anywhere between, I would say, one and two, maybe 3% for some of the better students that really gave all out efforts in that six week period. But you got to keep in mind that's without assessing nutrition, that's without me telling them what to do outside of this program. That's also without me being there all the time and counting on these teachers for carrying through this program and trusting that they didn't just stand on the sidelines and let the students do what they want. Not to say that teachers do that, but I wasn't there as a trainer blowing my whistle and getting, you know, fuel under their feet, you know? Yeah. I, I could see you wearing one of those drill sergeant hats with the whistle. Oh, Get, getting and, down on the kid's face when he's doing push-ups. Yeah, and it should have said <laughs> Jay-Z Fitness so that they never forget who did that to them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so just out of curiosity, because I, I, I have a couple of teachers that come here, and they've told me about some of their um, some of the issues they've had at the schools with physical fitness with um, parents not wanting the kids to do it. Did you have any backlash from any of those parents saying – that they want to exclude their child or it's too hard for them or anything of that nature. Are you seriously saying some parents don't want their kids to train? <laughs> yeah. Oh it's, my goodness. It's, it's real. It's a real thing. I can't believe it. I, I, I mean that alone. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I see, this is the problem. Anyone could become a parent, you know, but it's such a disservice to say, I don't want my kid involved in physical education. It is such a disservice. And no, the answer is no. I thank God did not have any backlash. At first, I had a little bit of a pushback on the principal, and the principal himself was morbidly obese, and he brought me in with the teachers, and he said to the teachers, listen, if you say no to this girl's thesis, I'm on board with you saying no, but I think <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a great opportunity, and you know we have nothing to lose. I donated all the equipment to the school when I was done, which you know gave a little bit of value there. You know, so the teacher said, as long as we're not responsible for taking time away from the classroom and it's only 30 minutes, then fine, we'll do it. I said, listen, if you guys have problems, concerns, you can call me. My job at the time uh, was that medical weight loss clinic. They already signed off that if I need to go, I could do a little costume change in the bathroom into my fitness clothing, <laughs> run to the school in Anaheim and you know perform what i needed to for 30 minutes and then come back to work sweaty and put my suit back on which i did many times but at the end of it all all the students got on board the first week i'll be honest with you the students were not in shape i had to sit them down and i said you know who's your favorite athlete and they named all their favorite athletes i said do you think the very first day that they worked out that they were who they are that you see on tv and they're like no I said, well, what? <laughs> you answered just like a, like a child. No. <laughs> right, right. And then I said, well, what do you think they had to do? And they're like looking at each other and they're like, practice? I said, yes. I said, when you practice what you're looking to be in life, you show up every day and give a little bit more of yourself, you get better. And at the end of the day, you've got to trust in yourself that no matter where you start, whether it's fit or the most unfit person that you know, you gotta have faith that this is the right path for you because it's gonna help you with increased cardiovascular fitness, it's gonna promote healthy blood sugars, it's gonna improve your muscle endurance, which is great for people who are aging, okay? Because mu without muscle endurance, you're not gonna be able to stand up and sit down and get up from up off the floor, if you will. It's a shorter workout, quicker results, higher calorie expense, okay, because we have that epoch, which burns fat up to 36 hours after, okay, you're not sparing muscle, and you're also, uh, you know, increasing your caloric expense, you're burning calories, you know, that are equivalent to that three-hour run you were talking about. I'm not going to say three hours, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you run at a steady state at 65% of your max for an hour, you could achieve that in 30 minutes with high intensity interval training. It's half the time. Okay. Let me, I'll ask you a couple, uh, just as I know that people are very they're, They, they want to know what this is going to do for them as well. So you, you, you add a lot of met, you had a lot of metrics right there as well. 
I'll just ask you a couple things that let me know if it would help people with this or not. And we're thinking about people who are 40 plus, okay? Would it stall off someone going to live in a retirement home? Oh my <laughs> silly, gosh. Silly silly questions. <laughs> I I'm just I'm <laughs> thinking I'm thinking worst case scenarios with here and I mean I mean <laughs> seriously, people I I've heard this before. Look, so someone said the I think it was Dan John actually said that he said that the the difference between living in a retirement home and living on your own is being able to squat in a toilet. Okay, yeah. You know, here's the deal. <laughs> the doc the doctor I worked for um at Senogenics, this this you'll love, okay? He had in his in his office, okay, this is a doctor that gets paid five thousand dollars for just the evaluation, okay? We're not talking about any treatment, okay? Five thousand dollars in back of him, it says and, and, and it's basically a quote directed to other medical doctors. It says, your patient is going to die in a hospital bed while my patient dies at the top of a huge mountain. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, wait, this is what he had at all of his uh, the speaking engagements as well? <laughs> Dude, okay, my point is this. That was his affirmation, okay? If you want to die a slow death and be miserable on medications in a nursing home, which by the way, once you go in a nursing home, there's never a guarantee that you're gonna die right away. You might live there for a very long time being dependent on nurses and everyone else who goes home at the end of the day to their families with their independence and you know their health, okay? Or you could be like my 96-year-old grandfather who peacefully passed away in his sleep, didn't feel an ounce of pain because he was a fighter physically like literally he was a fighter. Uh, he owns a boxing business in New York city. Okay. And you know, he didn't even feel an ounce of pain. He like literally took his last breath with a smile on his face. I have my 93 year old grandmother who's still alive with us. Thank God for her who does water aerobics in her bathtub every day. Wow. Uh, yeah. So you get to choose whether you go to that nursing home or whether you have vitality and strength and physical fitness. And for me, I'd rather not ever step foot in a nursing home. I would rather forever never use a cane, never use any sort of external device to help me get from point A to point B. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I'd be on board with that. And I'm guessing too, your your grandparents were they ever actually were they ever afraid of falling and not getting up, or was that a reality to them? Well, my grandfather was a fighter, okay? He was a physical, like a professional athlete, and he never struggled with weight, ever. Um, the reason why he died at 96 and not over 100 is because he got hit by a car in New York City, which debilitated him from walking very well. And, you know, he had a very slow, slow, slow um, downfall. It wasn't fast. It wasn't like you know, that made it break him. He just had to, you know, not walk a couple of miles a day like he used to because he was in pain. And, you know, when people have pain, they don't want to move, which to your point, if people living to this podcast have any sort of structural pain, maybe high intense, high intensity interval training needs to be done in a more controlled environment where you're not doing anything to compromise your joints. You're not increasing the pain threshold, but you're you know, like the elliptical or even the bike, okay? As long as your form is good, you're set up on the bike correctly and everything's ergonomic, number one, you're gonna drop your weight. And number two, you're gonna really improve your cardiovascular fitness, which, you know, is gonna help you with circulation and with your ability to fight off any sort of arthritis because movement is the best medication for arthritis. And I think people need to understand that. You know, mm -hmm. you don't move, your arthritis is going to be stiff and you're not going to ever get over that. So you got to get past those first few minutes of discomfort, if you will. And eventually your body, it's like lubing the joints, you know, lubing mm -hmm. the, the car. You're doing that to your body when you exercise. Yeah. And anytime anyone brings up arthritis, um, I, I always give a, I always give a sigh thinking, I, I don't know if I want to talk about this or not. You know, because it's, it's a very debilitating, I think, thing that people feel like is the cause of their problem. And, I mean, there's people active all over the place. There's people who are very functional, people who are in great shape. They have arthritis, too. I mean, and there's very different, there's a lot of different grades of arthritis, you know. So, 
I think it depends if they want something to hang on to with that, you know. But I think you're right with just get moving. I mean, you'll you'll start to feel better. It'll loosen up. You're not doing any more damage a lot of the time. I guess you could be. Um, but that's why they need to be assessed, I guess. Um, but I'm right there yes. on board with you. I think just, just get to it. Start doing it. Absolutely. And honestly, just ask a trains professional like you or me, um, you know, reach out to us. I, I mean, I, I love this stuff. I love helping people and I love answering questions and guiding people in the right direction. And if it's not working out with me because someone lives far away, then it's finding a trains professional who has great credentials, who knows what they're doing and will only help you and not hurt you. Mm -hmm. Um, is there, what have you learned over the last, since we talked last, maybe it was about a year ago, any, any breakthroughs in, uh, nutrition or fitness that you're like, holy shit, everyone needs to hear about this. Oh gosh. <clears throat> well, and by the way, my voice is very sexy because I teach a lot of classes and <laughs> <laughs> you sound, you, you know. sound just like Crystal, by the way, she comes in every Monday, just raspy as hell having like, like sore throat drops. I'm like, are you sick? And she's like, yeah. no, I've just been coaching. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I, I coached so much. I coached like 20 classes in the last week and it's way too much for me. But, you know, I love coaching and I'm grateful that I am able to do that. But um, to answer your question. So one thing that is very, very big, and this is something I've been looking at for the last two years, actually, is injury prevention. I think it's the responsibility of my industry to slow the heck down with their exercise recommendations stop having people do very ballistic movements that are you know in the long run going to hurt them do things that are more conservative get people to understand what it takes to engage their core muscles and understand proper muscle sequencing okay because if we could just get back to the basics on how to do a phenomenal squat and how to do a phenomenal push press exercise and how to be functional then I think that's what's missing. We got to stop thinking, oh, I want my clients to do burpees and I want my clients to do sprint intervals on the track. That's all great. But at the end of the day, I don't even care if it's a 20 year old client. You cannot, you know, help somebody if they don't have a strong foundation. Okay. Yeah. It's like, it's like building a house on a mud pit. You got to make sure the foundation is strong before you put the architecture up. And that's how I look at the human body. So I'm working very closely with, you know, experts like you and other chiropractors and other physical therapists and orthopedic surgeons to truly understand kind of working backwards. Like what are the, pre the prevailing injuries that we're seeing in these medical offices? Why are these injuries happening and what needs to be done differently to avoid it? Um, another thing to that point is, and it sounds crazy, but it might be as simple as people need to pay attention to their posture throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Because if you're driving, you know, I was talking to my contractor earlier, his spine is falling apart because he sits in the car two hours each way to, to work. He lives all the way up north. So, you know, people need to first stretch their bodies regularly throughout the day, which means stand the heck up. Okay. Don't sit for longer than 20 to 30 minutes at a time. Um, you know, stretch your, your muscles so that your muscles are not pulling your joints in different ways, causing the joint to be compromised and then do a fitness program based on where you're at. And if you have any pain while you're exercising, you need to ask yourself, well, why is this causing me pain and what do I need to shift to build back the strength that will, you know, take away that pain? Yeah, that's good. It's a lot of stuff. Shoot. Um, you know, actually I got a good resource for you. It's a uh... I just I just interviewed. It's actually gonna be live by the time this comes live. It's it's session sixty two. It was a mind blowing blowing one. It was uh, Dr. Richard Olm, and we talked about the concept of functional capacity, functional gap, and complete failure. And basically, it was in a nutshell, it was how long can you hold good form, like perfect form? How long can you hold crap form until you actually are that puddle on the ground where you see a lot of people having their workouts that way? So recognition of where your form degrades if they can find that or be cued to decrease how many how much how, how much time they're in that gap i guess i shouldn't say gap the the time that they have that crappy form the better their injury prevention is going to be because if we keep training them with crappy form for like say they had good form for five seconds bad form for 20 then their predominant movement is going to be that compensated form 
So when I heard it, when we were talking, it was like, oh my God, like this, this one it catches is going to change people's lives, I think. So I'll give you, I'll give you the pre-edited one on that. I think you'll like it. I love that. I would love to listen to that. And honestly, I think that that's the very first step from a physical standpoint is conquering good postural skills because we're in a very social media dominant, you know, environment where everybody's crouching their head forward and looking at their cell phones. And then they put that same posture when they drive. And in LA, man, you're sitting in the car for like at least 30 (laughs) minutes. Okay. You know, so if we could just get back to the basics of moving and stop being so stagnant, like we're sitting here on this interview. Are you still on that twirl around chair doing cartwheels over there? I'm not swirly. I'm not the swirly chair. I'm, I'm on the other chair that squeaks, the squeaky chair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, but it's like if you could change different environments, like I have a stability ball next to my desk. I also just invested, what is it, like 200 bucks in a sit-stand desk so that I stand to type my notes up on patients that I just talked to or fitness programs I have to write or nutrition coaching that I have to do. I'm never seated for long periods of time. And with my exercise program, I always honor what my body's telling me. Sometimes I'm a power walker. Sometimes I'm a jogger. Sometimes I'm a runner. Mm-hmm. You know, so listen to your body. Talk to a professional. Get those assessments with a trained, awesome doctor who more looks for prevention versus putting you on a bunch of pills. And um, with nutrition, to answer that question, you know, I'll be honest with you, I've been thinking about this for eight years now, and I, I, I think I was a little bit ahead of my time here, but we have a huge problem with nutrient absorption. And The problem is not necessarily that people are not eating clean. I think that A, people are not eating enough of what they're supposed to, and B, their stomach and gut and whole gastrointestinal tract is not functional. It's not built to absorb the nutrients that they have in the the diet they're consuming. So I think that we have to take a very hard look at that and start to um, work more with, uh, I wanna call them functional medical doctors, like the true ones, They look at nutrient deficiencies. They're actually looking at allergens to see what certain people are not responding well to because if your body is working hard from a nutritional standpoint to break things down, then, you know, you got a bigger plumbing issue that needs to be addressed and that, that could be very costly if you don't address it. Okay. You could talk to every nutritionist, every dietitian under the sun, but if you don't address the issue, I feel that, you know, we're, we're missing something here and you know, I'm very thankful that I have a bunch of experts in my back pocket that I refer a lot of people to. And I say, let's first see what's going on. And from there, let's, you know, tackle it one step at a time. That's good. You're evolving as a person, I can tell. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that you probably had the, the moments that I have where like five years ago, I thought something was, was solid stone in, in regards to like my uh, thought process and all of a sudden it reverted or, or modified, um, always evolving, I guess. So I'm sure you're doing the same. Um, yeah. with your, before, before I let you go, I can't, I can't help it since on your Skype thing, it's you breaking the chains of obesity. I want to know a couple of the tools cause there's 107 and I don't know why the heck you picked 107. <laughs> but but I gotta know because I haven't I haven't read it yet. So but I do need to get a copy from you. Which oh, everyone you there don't will... have a co- you don't have a co- oh my god I'm sending you one after this podcast. No I don't see I didn't even know that you had the podcast too. You said I sh- okay so everyone <laughs> she's got a podcast as well. Apparently this is new news to even me. So we need to market this podcast better. What is that called by the way? It's called Fit Because, and you know the reason why we call it that is because you don't have to be shredded to be fit. So people need to get in the habit of saying, "Well, I'm fit because I'm mentally fit. I have my, I have my shit together. You know, I I think clearly. I'm good with my business." Like people need to know that those shredded people we see on magazines and Instagram, you know, they're some of the most effed up people I've ever met in my life when it comes to organizational skills and entrepreneurship. Like they're just clueless. So you know, being fit is being mentally fit, emotionally fit, physically fit, spiritually fit. I don't know if I said that already, but also financially fit. (laughs) And when you have all those sectors in place, then you could say, well, I'm fit because, you know, so (laughs) you're going to be interviewing people who are fit because in all eight realms. Is that, is that what, is that what, is that what the podcast is? Which eight rooms? No, eight, eight realms. Eight, eight, eight sectors. Oh, sorry. You said oh, sector right. realms. <laughs> I thought I had to run to a different room. I'm like, what room? Yeah. It's one of those high-intensity games, kind of like hopscotch. <laughs> 
Yeah, get people's heart rate up. Yeah, no, we are, um, it's just me and George Veter. He's a six-time rodeo champion. He's a guy who came from a farm up in Fresno, California, and he hit rock bottom one year when he lost his job. He had a family and kids, and he's sitting in a dark room because he couldn't pay his electricity bill. He attached a flashlight to a revolving you know, fan above him and read all these self-help books to pull himself out of this mess <laughs> and uh, you know, ended up going into financial advisement, which ironically, after being in rock bottom, he's like, who the heck's going to follow that? But he is one of the most intelligent people I know. He's very, very self-read. Um, he's always developing himself. He's 54 years young. I've personally helped him with his nutrition and get this. He's a six time rodeo champion and he's still at the age of 54 competes. Wow. Okay. Okay. So the guy is a multimillionaire. He manages a lot of money, but he's also a humble man who still runs his cattle ranch and, you know, is a huge philanthropist and is just such a, a beautiful human being. So the Fit Because podcast is also a vodcast on fitbecause.com. We just interview each other and, you know, we just get some really good content in a 30 minute period because people have the attention span of a doornail. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ho I, hopefully. <laughs> I, I can't guarantee people even listen to this, this length of a podcast. I imagine right. you were both like Kelly Ripa and Regis, right? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> what what I gotta really notice is when you told me that story, I giggled and I realized, oh, I shouldn't giggle because it's a solemn story. But I had to, I envisioned him in the dark room attaching his his a flashlight to a ceiling fan, but the ceiling fan being on and it's spinning. Did did don't tell me he didn't put it on the blade. He put it on the center. Uh no, I don't think <laughs> I don't think the thing was rotating. I think it was still. But oh. Because yeah, but because he attached the actual oh. uh, light device to shine down, so he's not holding it. Got it. And the power is off, so it couldn't have been on. So that makes sense as well. Right, right. So yeah, I mean, I don't know how long that was for, but the point is, <laughs> the guy was in his twenties. I mean, now he's fifty-four. He's got four kids. He's got you know properties up north, and he said to me, "It'd be great if I could share my knowledge with as many people as possible." And I said. You know, my number one goal is to get people to know the truth about how to age well and how to take care of themselves and how to evolve in this mess that we have in this country and still stay on top of their game and stay positive and stay committed to being the best version of themselves. So that's why we put this together. And, you know, if people are not listening to this length of this interview, then they'll never know about my uh, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> no, no. They, well, maybe I didn't record the intro yet. So uh, maybe I'll, I'm going to put it in the front. So you got to oh, make sure. <laughs> yeah. Got to make sure it's in the front. So I didn't get to do my own personal uh, introduction of you yet. So I don't know what I'll say yet. So it'd be nice. Um, but that's cool. You get to do a podcast with someone who's really awesome. Like I, I find that like the people you surround yourself with, if they're extremely positive and they have good information and they, I mean, you kind of feed on that, you know, like you don't want to be around downers all the time and he sounds like a good one. So not a downer. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, no, I, I do my very best to embrace, you know, even people like yourself, as soon as I met you, I was like, wow, this guy's great. You know, you're just, you really know your stuff. And I love, I, I just love you as a person. I think you're very down to earth and you know, you're, you're a doctor on top of that. You embraced Alan when you met Alan, my guy who just graduated chiropractic school a year ago. So you know, it's 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 not hard to come across great people. I think it's harder to involve those great people with great thoughts and great energy in your day so that it lifts you and never, you know, gives you self-doubt and any sort of fear. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. You're my girl, too. <laughs> <laughs> Al man. Alan, Alan, it's not like that, okay? Uh, <laughs> so how, how can everybody reach you before we let you go? Okay. Well, they could visit me on my website, JZ, J as in Jennifer, Z as in Zebra, fitness.com, jzfitness.com. They can email me through there. They could check out. I have a blog on nutrition. Um, I also have a nutrition app called JZ Fitness Nutrition. If they want to get a jump start on their nutrition, they can use that. Um, it gives you, it's like a, a nutrition coach at your fingertips. It gives you a, a response to everything you enter. And um, then I have my book so that people can learn how to break their chains of poor lifestyle habits. Nice. Okay. I'm going to link to all those on the show notes as well. Um, I will show you how to find those in a second. But uh, Jay-Z, hold on and uh, I'll come right back, okay? Okay. <laughs> 